Hey, I'm Ben. This is Hyperfine. Today we're talking structural formulas you need to know for the ARE 5.0 exam. We're going to talk about the flexural stress equation, F equals M over S. We're going to cover all the technical information you need to know, what the variables are, how you solve this equation, how you use it to solve problems on the ARE. Um, but before we talk about technical stuff, I want to talk a little about formulas and test strategy. ARE 5.0 exams are about concepts and fundamentals and less about memorizing you know, a list of facts. And so while the equations tend to cause people stress, thinking that maybe they don't know all the equations or they're not going to know how to solve them, uh, really the, the times when you have to actually plug in a bunch of variables into an equation is pretty rare. It's a lot more common that you're going to have to understand a structural system or a mechanical system and make you know, an informed guess based on something you don't actually know. And it's important to keep in mind that we're taking an architecture exam, right? We're not taking a structures exam. We're not taking an electrical engineering exam. And so the answer is usually an architectural answer. And the more we understand the formulas and what the variables are, the better we can make an educated guess. And so while I am going to go over this formula in detail and explain the variables and how you solve it and how you use it, the important thing is not to try to memorize anything that I'm talking about but to understand these concepts so that when you're faced with a similar question where you're not sure what the answer is, you know how to go about solving it. Sort of like, I don't know if any of you guys had this experience, but when I took physics and calculus in college on exams, we're usually able to bring in like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of notes. And I would always fill this thing up both sides with like every single formula and every single variable and every single thing I wanted to possibly remember for the exam. Then of course you get on the exam and I have the formula, it doesn't really mean much because I don't understand it, I don't know how to solve it, and the questions are never like, fill in these blanks and tell me what the answer is, right? It's always a question where you have to take in and process information. So that beautiful sheet of notes wasn't all that helpful to me. So hopefully that's your takeaway from this video. Learn concepts, don't try to memorize these facts. If you learn the concept, you'll be able to solve a problem on the exam that you haven't seen before. So I've got some more helpful links down in the description below. I'm going to try to do more of these formula videos. If you have a specific request for one, leave that in the comments. Um, that's it for now. Let's get started. F equals M over S, also known as the flexural stress at the extreme fiber formula. This is the first one listed in the NCARB handbook, so you are definitely going to have to know this and understand how to use it. If we look at the variables, the equation F equals M over S, F is the flexural stress, which is the resistance to deformation, so how much the beam is going to resist bending. M is the bending moment, uh, and S is the section modulus, so we'll talk about both of these in a minute. But the important thing to note that I'm probably going to repeat myself a bunch of times is that if you want to decrease the flexural stress, you have to either decrease the bending moment or increase the section modulus of a beam. So M is the moment. It's the force trying to bend the beam. And if you are familiar with diagrams like this that show basically the different beam loading and supporting conditions, um, they'll show you basically the diagram of how it's supported and how it's loaded, the shear and the moment. And if you've looked at these formulas over here, one of them is always going to be the max moment formula, which is a formula you can actually use to solve the max moment instead of doing these diagrams. So while I am literally talking about equations now, the point of this course and this video is for you to know that the equations are just a way for you to understand what's going on. So don't necessarily worry about literally solving the math every time. If you understand what's going on and if you can learn the equation to help you understand, that's the ultimate goal. So if we want to find M, if we want to find the moment, we can use different formulas based on the loading conditions. So you can find those diagrams anywhere um, on Google. They're in the architecture uh, graphic standards at the end. The three most typical ones you're going to see are uniform distributed load support on both ends. That's the one we just looked at. The max moment for that one is WL squared over 8, where W is the weight per linear foot, L is the length. Uh, a, a center point load supported at both ends, so that's going to be P or big W, so that's just going to be the weight multiplied by the length of the beam multiplied by 4. And then a uniform distributed load supported at one end, aka a cantilever, which is going to be weight per linear foot multiplied by the length squared divided by 2. So just from these two formulas, the, the last one, the first one, you can see that the max moment on a cantilever is going to be a lot greater than the max moment on a beam support on both ends. And that kind of just makes sense to it if you think about it and look at it. And here's the math to show you why that is. 
So I will get into some diagrams in a minute about how you sort of think about this in an actual structural system, but let's talk about section modulus next. This is the strength of the beam due to its cross-section, i.e. its size and the amount of material. There's also formulas for this, and I had a question, multiple questions on the exam on my PPD and PDD that sort of use this formula, and I remember one of them. I thought I had to solve the equation, and it didn't give me everything I needed, but I sort of remembered that there was an equation for section modulus, and so I sort of remembered that it was like S equals BH3 over 2 or something like that, which it's not. It actually is BH squared over 6 minus BH cubed over 6H for an I-beam, and there's no way you're going to have to actually know that or memorize it. So if you are doing something similar on your exam and you're trying to remember a formula you learned in like Structures 101, you're probably looking at the question wrong. You're probably missing the easy answer because it's not about doing the math. It's about understanding. And so later after my exam, when I was debriefing myself at the bar, um, I thought about it and I was like, you know, I didn't actually need to do that math. I just needed to understand that either M has to go down or S has to go up. So as for section modulus, there are tables for this and the section modulus will change based on the size, uh, basically the, the type of the beam it is. Um, but you're probably familiar with the, the I-beam or the W-flange. So here's a screenshot from Engineering Toolbox where they've recreated the AISC steel tables. And so over here, you've got the designation of the beam. So a W27 by 84 is a beam that's about 27 inches tall and about 84 pounds per linear foot. Um, and they increase in size as you go up. So the top one here is about 27 inches tall again, but it's 178 pounds per foot. And these are giant beams. And section modulus is given to you here. So we care about uh, S of X. So the section modulus about the X axis because we're trying to figure out the strength of the beam based on how much material is far away from that X axis. Uh, and so really all you need to know is that these values go up as the size of the beam goes up, as it gets heavier. And if I if you could scroll this down, you'd see like the next one down is like W24s or something. So as the beam gets taller and it gets heavier, there's more material here. And so the section modulus will go up. So let's look at a practical example. Here's a floor system I made up that's 20 feet wide or 20 feet length. Uh, the beams are 10 feet on center. The weight of whatever's sitting on it, the weight of the floor system itself, is 30 pounds per square foot, and assume it's supported on each end. So before we get started, uh, just take a minute, pause the video, see if you can figure out what the moment is on this beam. And I'm going to show the answer in three, two, one. So the max moment here is 15,000 foot-pounds. I don't want to get too bogged down into the calculation of the equation. That's really not what this course is about, but I'll go through it quickly. So with beam spacing at 10 feet on center and a weight of the floor at 30 pounds per square foot, uh, and with the simply supported beam with the uniform distributed load, our max moment formula is going to be WL squared over 8. This W is actually weight per linear foot because it has to get multiplied by the uh, length squared. So if we consider what one linear foot of that of this weight equals, it's the 30 pounds multiplied by 10, right? Because it's one foot this way and 10 feet that way. Because this beam at 10 feet on center, the tributary area, it's taking five feet on this side and five feet on that side, right? So it's 10 feet. So little w is 30 times 10 multiplied by 20 um, squared, the whole thing over eight, and the moment is 15,000 foot-pounds. Um, you can ask questions if you want more detail on that, but the point of this is to understand how we're going to go about making this system stronger. If we look at our initial equation, F equals M over S, what can we do now that we've got this set up to decrease F? And so one thing we've got to do is decrease the moment. So before I go to the next slide, um, I'm going to show two options for decreasing the moment on this beam. I want you to think about what those two things could be. All right, let's move forward in three, two, one. The first thing you could do, and these are actually no particular order, is um, increase or decrease the spacing of the beam. So instead of every 10 feet, you do one every five feet, which would decrease the tributary area. So if we still have the same moment formula, WL squared over eight, um, the length of one linear foot is actually halved because instead of getting five feet on each side, you only get two and a half feet on each side. So 
the uh, length here where we're finding the actual weight goes from 10 to 5, so that gets halved. The entire thing ends up getting halved as well, so the moment is going to be 7,500 foot-pounds. And then the next option, which might be the better option for absolute reduction of the moment, is to put a beam mid-span. So you still have the original spacing at 10 feet on center, but now you've got a beam mid-span, and so the length is now halved. And because the length in our formula is squared, whereas the width is just, or I'm sorry, the, the weight per linear foot is just the weight per linear foot, if the length is halved, that has a lot bigger effect. So instead of multiple, you know, instead of doing 20 squared, now you're only doing 10 squared, the entire moment now becomes 3,750 foot-pounds. So now the thing to keep in mind on the exam is that you probably aren't going to have to do the actual equation and actually plugging in values. You know, they said they don't give you this equation, so I doubt they're going to expect you to actually calculate the moment. But now that you understand it, now you can maybe make a more educated guess or have a greater understanding of which of these systems is going to have the greatest flexural stress and which one you're going to choose if you have to make an if you have to make a choice about which system is going to reduce the flexural stress on a beam you've got an understanding of things you can do to reduce the moment um, and keep in mind this is not a structural exam this is an architectural exam and so there's probably going to be some type of architectural component you know like this beam mid span is going to have to have posts every so often are you able to do that in the space what if it's like a gym or something and you can't have columns every 10 feet or every 50, you know, 20 feet. So try to think about what the design implications are of these structural choices. So that was moment and as we talked about the other way to reduce the flexural stress on a beam is to increase the section modulus and I tried to get the definition of section modulus and it's the ratio of something to another and I don't understand it entirely so as an architect I know that the section modulus increases with the size and the amount of material that's in a beam and has something to do with like the area or the distance around the x-axis, whatever. All you need to know is what's going to increase the section modulus. So if we start with the W12 by 26, so this is an I-beam or W-flange that is about 12 inches tall and about 26 pounds per linear foot, it's got a section modulus of 33.4. Can you think about which of these beams are going to increase section modulus and thus decrease flexural stress and which ones will decrease section modulus and increase, I'm sorry, increase flexural stress. So I'm going to show the answer in three, two, one. So the first one should be obvious. It's still a W12, but it's heavier. So it's 35 pounds per linear foot, which means that there's more steel in that beam. There's more material. So the section modulus goes up. Just the opposite, the next beam is a W12 by 14. So it is a, um, it's also a W12, so it's just as tall, but it's lighter. It's only 14 pounds per linear foot, so there's a lot less material in it. The section modulus has decreased. The next beam is a W14 by 26, so it weighs the same, but it's taller. Um, and so you're getting further away from the x-axis. Um, and the moment of inertia is 35 and you can see keeping the weight the same and only increasing the size two inches was a very small difference, not even a two, whereas keeping the height the same and adding nine pounds per linear foot um, was a lot bigger of a increase in the section modulus. Anyway, the last one, which you probably wouldn't know unless you had a table, there's no really way, you know, these ones you can all tell just because you can compare the numbers directly. This one you can't, so you would have to look at a table for this one. Um, so a W10 by 60, it's 10 inches tall, 60 pounds per linear foot. This one actually has the highest section modulus. And I think that is all I wanted to cover on this equation. You're definitely going to have to understand it. You're definitely going to see it on the exam. Um, if you got any questions, leave them in the comments below. Thank you.